four. Organization. <laughs> Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your dig- digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour, whether you're listening to us through your radio on one of the 16 stations that is carrying our program through a simple radio app or a tune-in app. We appreciate that. Podcast replay or in-studio video replay. Thank you for that. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, get your trees looking better, and your grass to be greener, as well as preserving what you grow. And we do this indoors and out. There's a couple of ways in which you can get a hold of us. One being you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also give us a call right now or anytime. Our lines are always open 24-7. If we can't get to you at the moment, leave a message and we will call you back. You can do that by dialing 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. We've got a show lined up for you, a good one today, as we do every week. We're going to prepare our lawns for winter and we're going to do some seed saving, as well as our guest will be Katie, the kombucha lady, will be with us all about kombucha. She's the kombucha witch. Well, she can be both. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to learn about making home-brewed kombucha, as well as your garden questions. So let's get into the program, Holly. Uh, even though this is labeled a... Uh, vegetable show, we do need to maintain. Not everybody has their whole property uh, lathered in vegetable plants. They do have a lawn because it's kind of hard to let the kids run around when they're running over cucumbers and pumpkins and tomatoes. So they do you know, have yards. So there's some things in which we need to do in our yard in order to prepare it for winter. Many of the places uh, that you're listing our program in has uh, winters that uh, produce some cold pre- pre- precipitation and can be damaging to plants and uh, other species if we are not taking care of them. So first thing we want to do is as the leaves begin to fall, we don't want to leave the leaves on the, the the grass all winter long because it does smother out the grass. There are people who... Uh, do not care about their grass, and if that's you, this segment's not for you. But if you are wanting to maintain a somewhat presentable lawn in front, back, side, wherever, uh, this this segment would be best uh, to listen to. So we want to rake the leaves off, whether we mow them, we mulch them, we bag them, we put them on the garden for mulch, whatever the case is, we want to get them off the grass so it's not smothering the grass out. And... We want to rake up the gumballs. A lot of the maple trees, sugar gum maples, I believe it is, have a tremendous amount of gumballs. And uh, they are a pain to pick up, but you want to get them picked up so they're not getting crushed in the, in the ground, in the soil, uh, in, the, in the grass. So you want to get that cleaned up. And maybe <clears throat> you want to reseed your lawn. Maybe right now you're tired of the way the lawn looks. You've got too many weeds and not enough grass. Well, you can do that by just simply planting Pearl's Premium Plus low-maintenance grass seed. You can do that, and that grass seed, the unique uh, and, and beneficial aspect of that seed is it only needs to be mowed once every four to six weeks, and not weekly as you traditionally are mowing the grass, and it works very well. It uh, puts roots down in the ground four feet, so it reduces the water intake that you have to apply by 75%. Uh, So it's a really good 
alternative to traditional grass seeds that you would normally buy at the big box store. Pearl's Premium Ultra Low Maintenance Lawn Seed. And uh, just a, a plug for them, you can use my name, Joey20, J-O-E-Y-2-0, J-O-E-Y two zero to get 20% off your order at pearlspremium.com. Great, great company, great product, and especially if you don't like mowing your grass, a great alternative to the normal traditional grass that you get. So those are some some easy things in which we can do. Uh, there's some perennials and some plants and some trees that we also can um, – Work or work towards. Right. So you can, um, one thing you want to think about is your perennials, cutting them back if they need to be ba- cut back. And also a lot of times people will divide them at this time as well. So just you, don't cut back one thing and go, well, that gets cut back. We're just going to mow it. Not every plant gets cut back. Right. So and, you definitely have to do some research. Um, if you don't have information, you can certainly ask us. Right. And if you do it incorrectly, it can affect the production or the flowers next year. Right, definitely. Um, and same thing with dividing perennials. This is the, usually the time to, to divide them, and you want to do that. Um, another thing is you want to wrap the tree um, the tree trunks to avoid frost cracking. If you have a tree that maybe you just planted, this is something that could possibly be something you want to do. Uh, you can also use Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard also to protect the trunk of the tree from rodents, insects, uh, and weathering pr- uh, problems, uh, that works as well. But we want to take the steps necessary now because a few, let, let's just pick a, an arbitrary number. 15 minutes of work now can prevent you having to go to the garden center and buying a new tree next year. Right. Another thing you can do is you can, um, you can think about your rose bushes or anything that needs to be covered. I know a lot of people will cover their rose bushes, and if there's anything else similar that would have to be covered, that is another one. Now, some people will take and cover them and just pack them full with straw, a natural material. You're not covering them with those styrofoam cones that used to be all the rage, and it actually damages the plant to a certain degree because it keeps it too warm. These plants are designed for these areas, uh, you know, a zone, a zone three or four or five, whatever, but if it stays too warm over the winter it can alter the growth cycle and actually potentially kill it because it's not doing what nature intended it for to, to do. Right. Um, and then another thing is you can think about adding some bulbs. So whether that be to maybe this past spring, you were like, well, I want to update some stuff, whatever. This is, this is the time. So yeah, that would yeah. be like the tulips. <laughs> You, ha- you you can't go in the spring and plant bulbs. It doesn't work as well. No, you, no. you need to do it now. And the other thing, when you plant 40 or 60 or 80 bulbs on your property, make a little map so you know where they're at. So you're not planting something on top of them in the spring going, well, I don't think I – and then you start popping bulbs out of the ground. Uh, right. Because you will forget. Yeah. We all forget. Right. Um, another thing you can do is you can start – maybe you wanted to start a compost pile. Maybe you wanted to make like a compost tumbler. Or like a compost bin and you thought of that when it was like 90 degrees out and humid and you're like, heck no, I don't want to do that right now. Now is the time. And I'll get to it 17 years <laughs> later. You still haven't got to it. But as the weather gets cooler you're gonna, you're, and maybe you're looking for some outdoor projects to work on. Before. Kids, grandkids. Right. I have a friend who with his kid is building a compost tumbler because that's now he has the time to do so. So, yeah, you can you can think about that. Um, And then since you have all these fall leaves, if you don't have a garden to put them on, maybe like you don't have a vegetable garden or you don't have enough space, you can put those in your compost. Right. And we want to water. Watering in the fall is just as important as watering in the spring. If you underhydrate these plants, and it's based on if you're getting a lot of rain naturally, if if you're not, you need to hydrate the plants because a, a hydrated plant, and this kind of translates over to the vegetable world too if you've got a hydrated tomato plant or a hydrated pepper plant or fill in the blank and you're going to get a frost it is less likely that plant will be as severely affected by that cold temperature if it's fully hydrated than if it's not hydrated just like humans if we're not fully hydrated and our cell walls are not completely saturated with moisture we are more susceptible to pick up diseases and colds because our body is not 100% able to fight off those problems. Same thing with a plant. 
So we want to water. Yeah. And then you want to think about your pond. If you have a little pond or water feature or something, you want to possibly drain that. Or you or, can get a heating coil for it. Or you can get a heating coil. Yeah, you it. keep it wa- keep it water warmed all winter long. You're going to increase the bird activity a uh, hundredfold because the birds are going to come to that location to drink to bathe. Just just because it's winter doesn't mean birds stop drinking water. Right. So that's so, an, another thing in which you can do. That's a, that's a good one. Also, remember if you have a drip irrigation system, whether it's from DripWorks.com or some other manufacturer, be sure you at least blow the lines out, even if you don't pick it up. And, and drain it out, blow the lines out because water will set in those and can damage the um, emitters as well as potentially if too much water is laying in the line, it can pu- bust the pipe. Uh, and then you got to replace that in the spring too. So a lot of things to keep in mind here, not only for lawns, if you have a, a lawn system irrigation or if you have a drip irrigation system in your garden. Both need to be blown out, uh, whether professionally or, or by the, your own means. Yeah, that's something we'll we'll definitely have to do ourselves. Um, another thing is is you you may not want to cut back all of your plants, and you might want to do some research if you have some perennials that don't need to be cut back, and you can have them for just beauty. Some some uh, well, like color, m- like mums, like mums, yeah. right? Or some grasses. Yeah. Even if it snows, you know, if those grasses are tall enough, you're going to be able to see them mm-hmm. peeking through the snow. That's going to give you some brightness to all, your winter. Also, if you have them on. Each side of the driveway, you don't want to hack them down because when it snows, you might need those as a, a guide to get down the driveway at a certain level of sn- snow depth. Right. Um, so that's another thing. And then also, we're going to talk about this in the next segment, but collecting seeds. Um, and then possibly another thing you can do is say say you want to expand your garden, something like that. Maybe you can find some deals and a lot of clearance sales, whatever, whether it be like a pop-up raised bed or I don't know what else there would be deals on, but that could be an option. Yeah, look look at uh, look at our sponsors. Look at your local independent garden center. What are they wanting to get rid of now that you can make a, a, a deal with and get and substantially save money on next year's um, would-be purchases that you can reduce the price now on? And maybe even, yeah, like tools or even a, like maybe there's a vest that went on clearance that you want to wear in the garden or an apron or something. You don't know. So definitely uh, think about that. So there's just some of the things that uh, of of a mini multitude of lists in which you uh, can be doing in order to prepare your lawn as well as your property kind of and your garden. We kind of lumped all that together. We said it was about your lawn, but we kind of did a a number of other things. Also, if you have some uh, limbs that need to be trimmed that are that have died you can get rid of those before make sure you can get uh, those off the trees before they may fall on properties or um, people underneath them type of thing right well thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show this is our 29th show of 2020 did you miss last week's show what what you should be doing in the garden now is what we talked about things to do with apples and pears and our guest was garden podcast host jackie buyer you can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the wisconsin vegetable gardener podcast or we'll make it even easier to find them you send us an email to garden talk radio at gmail.com and in the subject line put show 29 we will send you the link We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about seed saving. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, to make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens have a tree or shrub issue, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil. So you can grow stronger plants, chemical-free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on your face 
and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Trimbin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, Creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Do you save seeds, or do you each spring get the urge and the itch to plant a garden and then you go to the garden center or you go to seed savers exchange and you purchase all your seeds fresh each year well you don't have to do that i mean there is some seeds that are recommended and we will go over those in which it's best to buy fresh each year however by saving your own seeds in your own environment in your own backyard can make a tremendous difference on your wallet and the quality in which the plants that you have and are planting and growing can have uh, production-wise. Right. So, yeah. So basically, a big big bonus to saving seeds is it saves money. And not only can it save you money, but say you have a friend who's like, I'm just getting into gardening. Um, Do you have any extra seeds? And I know that you and I, always seem to have extra seeds, right. Mo- mostly the time, yeah. Well, you look at uh, an onion or leek, which is a biannual, takes two years in order for the seeds to produce. You're looking at a couple of hundred, if not uh, you know, eight, nine hundred seeds on a couple of plants. Leaf lettuce, you can get several hundred, if not thousand of seeds off two plants. That's more lettuce than you and I and the uh, army of whomever could eat. Uh, tomatoes, it's, uh, a beefsteak tomato can produce Oh, 50, 60 seeds, uh, give or take. Mm-hmm. So there's a, the, the plants want to produce and provide you seeds. Now there are, and I, like I said, there are some plants in which it's not really good in order to save seeds. And two of them that are, are really should be noted are one, cucumbers. They are very easily cross pollinated. So if you've got a, a, uh, all white cucumber and you've got a Boston, Boston pickling cucumber in the same vicinity, those will most likely cross, and then you're going to have a more. If you're going to have a cucumber of some form, 
However, it may not be a pickling or it may not be a white. So you need to <clears throat> decide what you, you know, what's best to do on that aspect. But on the flip side of that, you could, you could save the seeds and see what happens. Right. And if you, maybe this is something that's fun for you. Maybe it's something that's fun for you and your kids or grandkids, whatever. But it's, it's, you can still save the seeds and they still will grow. Well, true. Now, if you're using that cucumber to pickle, then you'd want a pickling cucumber. Because cucumbers that are not pickling or designed to be pickle turn into mush. They're not good, right. not good pickles. Right. Another thing would be sweet corn, uh, heirloom sweet corn. If you are in the vicinity of a agricultural genetically modified field or adjacent to other types of hybrid or heirloom varieties, they will cross very easily. Mm-hmm. So you want to be aware of that. Now, if it's not a big deal to you, then so be it. But that, that's, uh, something that needs to be Noted, and tomatoes are very low chance of cross-pollinating, but if they are cross-pollinated, you do get very unique varieties in that type of uh, atmosphere with the the crossing of the tomatoes, but very, very slim chance of that happening. Now, let's talk about acclimation of your ecosystem, Holly. Right. So what happens is that year after year when you grow the same seed, seed variety, whatever, seeds, um, Let's just take bush beans, Pur- okay. royalty purple bush beans. Okay. Let's go that. So say that you have some royalty purple bush beans, and you pl- you plant them this year, and then you save you save some of the seeds from the bush beans, and you plant them next year in your garden. That seed, that variety, whatever that is, has been acclimated to your ecosystem, and then as you continue to save seeds over and over and over again from those plants, they become even more acclimated. And that basically what that means is that. Say you live in a climate that is, you can grow beans in many zones, but say you live in a climate where you might have um, higher humidity at night, uh, rain more rain during the day, and now your beans have become used to that as opposed to a broad range of area. Now, uh, to save, I guess the, when we talk about saving seeds, people often ask, what is the easiest seed to save? Well, I would say Probably beans. beans. You just let them go. <laughs> right, you, 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 just, you plant yeah. them and let them dry on the pod. We're talking like green beans or yellow pod green beans, like the, the term green, but yellow edible pod beans or royalty edible pod mm-hmm. beans. Let them grow. Let them dry on the vine, and then you harvest them. Watermelon, spit the seeds in a cup. Uh, right. pumpkin, um, that is if you have a seeded water. Right, right. Uh, peppers are very easy to, now, tomatoes, everybody loves to grow tomatoes because and I do know a couple of people who do not like tomatoes, that, but I'm, you know, uh, you're still but, friends with yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so tomatoes is a different type of seed saving procedure, correct? Yes, correct. So what you're going to do is for the tomatoes seeds, as we all know, they have that gelatinous, I don't know, slime, coating, whatever. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a jar or you can just take like a glass or whatever, put those seeds in there and then take some water and just kind of, I don't know, maybe like an inch of water. It doesn't have to be very deep. Let them sit in that inch of water for a couple days and it's going to, it's going to ferment. You'll be able to smell. You walk past, you can smell that it smells a little fermented. Once it's fermented, then you take a sieve. Well, you want to cover it with something with a. Oh yeah, you probably want to cover it with like a coffee yeah. filter and a rubber band or not something. Not some something that can breathe, not yeah. a plastic or a lid or anything no. like that. You want to, yeah. Yeah, so something that can breathe, so like a coffee filter or a paper towel, yep. whatever you got. I know not everybody has coffee filters these days. What's that? <laughs> right. So, um, so then you are going to take. Um, the seeds, once they have fermented a little bit, take a fine mesh sieve or strainer or piece of screen, whatever, and you want to rinse them, but you don't want to make sure you make sure you something that the seeds aren't going to fall through. Once they're rinsed, you can put them on a ceramic plate or bowl or whatever, and they're going to dry out a bit. And then you can flake them off and, and put them in a something like an envelope envelope yeah now uh nobody can see this but i'm holding a very important tool in this whole seed saving procedure and that is a a sharpie a a writing utensil right because if you start saving two if more than one type of tomato seed in even one type you may forget what type that was so then you've got six or seven ceramic plates sitting around 
with tomato seeds that are drying, and we've told this story before, right. then you have 25 years of mystery tomato seeds if you do save them. Otherwise, you may pitch them and start over next year. Right. You know, you're going to, you have them sitting there on a table or something. You're like, oh, I know. I'm going to remember the upper left is, you know, Cherokee purple. And then in three days when they're dry, you're going to be like, was that upper left or upper right? And I forget what I'm watching <laughs> on TV when it goes to commercial. Right. Yeah. Right. What was I? Oh, yeah, I was watching. Okay, it's back on now. Well, that might be a different issue. Oh, is that what that yeah, is? Okay. Yeah. So we want to now. Okay, we want to save those. That's how we save some seeds. Now, here's the other caveat c- to this: hybrid, organic, and heirloom variety of seeds. We talk about this early in the spring about planting these type of seeds. But this is very important to have that conversation now when we are attempting to save and carry over the traits and the the specific varieties of plants in which we want to save. So what are or what is a hybrid versus an organic versus a heirloom? So a hybrid, um, well, let's start start with an heirloom. An heirloom variety is something that is basically uh, been around for a long time. So it's like the original seed, it's the original cultivar, and it's... For whatever original, reason, it doesn't alter itself. No, it doesn't alter itself. It's the original seed. So that that seed could have been here for a bajillion years, since the dinosaurs or whatever. So... Probably got too acidic, and that's what killed them off, because they didn't like the acidity of the tomato. Maybe. Oh. Yeah. They were like, what? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> the dinosaurs... Yeah, so there's the heirloom variety, just like in a family heirloom, but it's been passed down for year to year to year. It's kind of like that, but with seeds, it's the original whatever. Um, so then we have organic, and organic means that it was growing. It's they're typically heirloom. They can be any kind of variety, but but not a hybrid. And they're growing in organic practices, so that means that the soil is organic, the growing conditions are organic. It's certified organic. The USDA typically. Um, is the company that well, certifies? It's, it, it's not a company; it's an it's organization, a bran- branch of government. I right. guess is what would be the technical okay, branch of government yeah. has certified that these seeds are grown organically, organic seeds in organic conditions. Right. Then we have hybrid, and hybrid is not GMO. It's, but not, a, it is, it's not a bad word. No, it's not a bad word. And actually, hybrids are really enjoyable to grow if you are not an experienced grower you don't want challenges of organic or or heirloom so hybrids are are happy seeds to grow but you cannot save them so hybrids well well, 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 you can save them yeah but okay well we'll get to that yeah okay (laughs) so let's confuse everybody as much as possible here (laughs) right yeah so hybrids are basically seeds that were a botanist or an agriculturist or what have you Basically, like a, a environmental related scientist, well, um, will grow these seeds and they'll grow with favorable conditions. So, let's say you have a tomato that is drought tolerant and early producing, and you grow, you allow these seeds to cross pollinate and grow together to create this one seed. So, like for a very popular one, well known is early girl tomatoes, and that is a hybrid, as opposed to like I think I said Cherokee, yeah, purple, whatever. So, yeah, so that's what a hybrid is. Now, hybrid seeds you can save, but it's going to take cycles. I think it's seven cycles of growing until it gets back to its... It's it's still going to grow what it wants, what you saved. It's not going to turn into a cucumber or or a pepper if you saved a tomato hybrid seed. (laughs) Right, but it's going to revert back to or maybe a combination of whatever whatever its mother or father is basically right so if you it, i don't know how they cross early girl but say they cross early girl with uh, a kitty cat tomato and a puppy dog tomato and that's how you get early girl so when you save the seed and you grow it next year it, it's not how we're just using it as an example so <laughs> yeah write write your letters to garden talk radio <laughs> gmail.com address it to hello holly <laughs> I would like to have some of your kitty cat tomato <laughs> plants, please. Yeah. So there's those are not real um, that I know of. But anyway, so once you save that early girl and you grow it next year, it's probably going to have favorable or will have favorable um, traits of either the kitty cat tomato or the puppy dog tomato. But it won't be a true early girl. And then it will take seven growing generations approximately, approximately to get it back to the early girl. And that's just how hybrid seed works. So yeah, that's that's one of the things you need to be aware of when it comes to saving 
seeds, uh, knowing what you've got so you can uh, project or predict what you will have. And again, label, label, and label, and label some more. Well, Holly, summer is over for many of us. We may get a pop of hot temperatures here and there, but most of the country is on the downward spiral as uh, virtual learning is in session. Maybe your kids or grandkids are physically in a classroom. Uh, The nights are getting cooler and longer, and you've forgotten about your lawn. Right. So just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards and those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only did they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs on your turf. So they can start again next year. So take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granular with a spreader, irrigate it into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use because it's really easy, but it is the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls those grubs. And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to bees and other pollinators and beneficial pollinators. So and you, if, you, in fact, Grub Gone has no label restrictions to use around flowering plants. So you don't have to get down on your hands and knees and remove those dandelions in the spring or now before you use the product. Grub Gone from Phylum Bioproducts, the natural choice. What is that website? PhylumBioproducts.com, P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, Bioproducts.com. Hang around if you're interested about making home-brewed kombucha. Our next guest is the person that you want to listen to, Katie, the kombucha witch, the booch witch, will be with us right after this. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program that helps your garden you can grow better. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Time to plant grass? It's true. With Pearl's Premium Ultra Low Maintenance Grass Seed, it needs mowing only once every four to six weeks rather than weekly. Pearl's Premium Grass grows four foot deep roots, so it needs 75% less water and outcompetes other grasses and most weeds without chemicals and stays green year round. Buy Pearl's Premium Grass at Whole Food Markets in New England, Quality Garden Centers, or buy online at pearlspremium.com. That's pearlspremium.com. And put in the discount code, my name, Joey20, that's J-O-E-Y-2-0, for 20% off discount Today and tomorrow only. PearlsPremium.com, the best grass seed you'll ever grow. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center. You've heard their name. Have you been to their facility? They have the largest variety of bulk materials available in the area. 40 
items to choose from, from compost to wood chips to gravel to sand and everything in between. You can finish up those last-minute projects that I know you want to get done so you're not thinking about them all winter long or having somebody tell you you should have got them done. Let Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center help you achieve that goal and maybe get some brownie points with the uh, family. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220 or visit them online at bluemels.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Katie Kuznasik is also known as the Booch Witch. Started, she started making kabucha in her kitchen in the spring of 2017. She's enjoyed the ritual ever since and saved thousands of dollars in the process. She enjoys bringing new DIY self-care techniques to those who seek that balance. She launched the Booch Witch in 2020 for the love of kombucha and the benefits of the drink that has provided her. Her unique home brewing procedure affords a creative and natural flair. Her website is boochwitch.com. Welcome to the program, Katie. Hey, thank you both so much, uh, Holly and Joy. Uh, thank you for the invite. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we are happy to have you because uh, kabucha seems to be the new kale, I guess. You know, a couple of years ago, kale was all the rage, and now kabucha seems to have taken that place. And people hear it. They're confused by it. They think it's an alcoholic beverage and is it safe to drink. So we're going to we're gonna debunk all of those myths and, and explain what it is. So basically, first of all, what is kabucha? at its rawest form? So at its like rawest form, kombucha is a fermented sweet tea. You know, you really want to get straightened down to it. That's what it is. Um, you want to go a little bit into it. Uh, there's a scoby on top, and it's kind of like this little mushroom-looking thing that ferments. It basically ferments your sweet tea into kombucha throughout, you know, about a two-week process. Now, when we talk about a SCOBY, which, Holly, that, that the SCOBY stands for? Well, why don't we have Katie? Yeah, Katie, Katie you, tell us. Yeah, Katie, tell us what the SCOBY stands for. Uh, symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. Now, can one create this their own SCOBY, or is it something that is best recommended to get it from a mother or an a tr- already existing SCOBY? You know, you can definitely make your own SCOBY at home. I do have a SCOBY farm and have, you know, those available for sale on my website. I do also, you know, when I do classes, I I teach uh, people how to make kombucha at home, which we can talk about later. But all those classes, everyone gets a SCOBY. So you walk out of there, you're ready, you know, ready to go with that. You can make it on your own um, with the retail kombucha. I really do recommend getting it um, from someone you know, a brewer or, you know, a reputable, reputable place online. Okay, that definitely makes sense. So why did, you, why did you start brewing kombucha and what inspired you to teach others to do so? I, uh, so I started making kombucha because, honestly, it was getting too expensive for me to buy. Um, I, you know, I had worked really hard uh, to to get to uh, some personal health goals. And, you know, to maintain that, one of the things I stopped doing was eating and drinking a lot of, like, really sugary stuff. One of those things I was addicted to, well, not really addicted, but I really love, like, Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi. So I started actually replacing that with kombucha. Um, I saw it at the store. Um you know, had kind of been, you know, in, in my job, they travel out to both coasts, um, you know, uh, before the pandemic and, uh, noticed this was out there and kind of looked into it and really, you know, liked it. Um, so it's kind of an, an alternative, you know, healthier, healthier alternative, uh, to me. And, um, also kind of helped me with some, some little issues, you know, within my gut, um, just personally. 
So, you know, it kind of, you know, I started drinking two, three, maybe four bottles a week. And at about two or three dollars a piece, I mean, gosh, that really added up. And I just couldn't justify it, but I didn't want to give it up. So I actually looked into it online and then started talking to my brother-in-law about it. Um, and all of all, and my brother-in-law has been brewing kombucha. And I, you know, I think that that's, if you talk to people out there, it's like, oh yeah, I know someone who brews kombucha. And, and you know, I, I think that more and more people, as it's becoming more popular, uh, you know, to drink, are starting to do that at home. So. Well, you talk that about, is, you, you talk about oh, the gut sorry. health. You, you talk about the gut health. It, it, can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Because obviously, we all know Diet Coke is uh, not the best uh, beverage in order to consume. But kombucha, it does have beneficial properties for your body. It does, you know, and I I always make it clear in my classes, and you know, I I'm not a health professional. I'm I'm a person who, who loves to, you know, share, you know, cooking recipes and, and an educational process. But for me, you know, and, and I like to share my personal experience, you know, for me, it really helps uh, get rid of some really stubborn lower ab fat that really had just been bothering me for so long. And no matter what exercises I did, I just couldn't get rid of it. Um, you know, I, I noticed that uh, after drinking this regularly, I, I was starting to feel better. And, you know, gradually that was along with uh, diet and exercise is really going away. And being able to, to drink it, have a source at home, you know, to make it on my own is, has been good for me to maintain that as well as some other some other, he- other healthy aspects that I think everyone enjoys. Now, just like everything, this this may not be the fix-all to end-all for your personal problems. You want to seek a physician's a- a- advice, uh, but but for Absolutely. you, you have found that this has been beneficial to you and your lifestyle. Right. I, you know, I say I am the booch witch. I'm not uh, the booch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, this this is just what's worked for me, and uh, and you know, I I like to share it with friends. I started talking with, you know, people at work and and some of my friends, and they started asking me, you know, gosh, could 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 I try some of your kombucha? And then they, you know, they liked it, and they're like, oh, how do you make it at home? So I'd have them over, and uh, you know, love to do that and and share the process. And you know, a couple of them asked me, you know, gosh. Have you ever considered about uh, considered starting a, a business and doing this in a more professional way? And thought, why not? So that's why I, that's kind of why I started the Booch Witch. Well, somebody with the name the Booch Witch probably you have multiple uh, batches going at one time. But for somebody who may want to start on a very small scale, is this something that they have to continue doing? Nonstop, or can they do it a little bit in the spring or summer, and then take a break? Or how does how does the manufacturing or the production of kombucha work? Can can one stop and start whenever they choose to? Um, so once you have kind of a healthy scoby and a healthy process going, you know, like basically once you get the hang of it, once you're established and you're and you're uh, pleased with your results. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's fine to, to take a break. I actually have a, a blog that really goes into that detail on my website, boochwitch.com. Um, there, because you can take a break, you know, for a week to, you know, a couple weeks, you can totally take a break for kombucha. But that's a little, you, if you want to make sure that your brew stays healthy, you know, you kind of, there are some things that I recommend you do. So I do recommend that if anyone's out there listening, take a look at that blog. I also have some tips if you're going to be away for several months, you know, if your job is shipping you somewhere or, you know, you just don't want to brew for a couple of months, I do have some advice on how to do that the best way too. So, yeah, you, you can definitely uh, take breaks from it. Uh, for me, I love uh, kind of the weekly ritual of making kombucha at home. It's It's been something that's kind of been an important part of getting ready for my week ahead. And, and the people that I talk to that make kombucha at home kind of enjoy that, too. It's kind of, a, you know, something that I, I look forward to every week. So, But, you know, uh, taking a vacation or something like that, there, there's always something 
to be said about that as well. Well, that brings up a question. How, how much do you make at one time and how long are those batches good for? Do they go vinegary uh, essentially or if you make too much at one time and don't consume it? How, how, what is your strategy? Oh, you know, I, like, like you guessed before, yes, I do have, uh, probably more than what's normal for <laughs> kombucha at home that's currently brewing. Um, but for, in, in my class that I teach, you know, and, uh, I recommend people start with just a gallon, you know, and, and that'll give you, you know, a couple of four-ish bottles every week once you get started, once your scoby's established. Once you go through that flavoring process and the um, proper fermentation process, and then when you refrigerate it, you know I I say it's I usually try to consume all my kombucha within within a month. After that, you know I I start to worry about the carbonation that might be building up inside of that. Um, you know you never know. Sometimes it can be a, a surprise. <laughs> Definitely. So uh, we are talking with Katie, a.k.a. the Booch Witch. So um, Joey and I have only made, I guess, plain kombucha, whatever. Yeah, plain kombucha. But I see that there's flavored kinds at the store. I know I've seen um, on your Instagram you have flavored them. How how does one flavor their kombucha? and Do it correctly. Do it correctly, yeah. So I think that, well, there are several steps to making kombucha at home. And one of the most important things cleanliness, make sure your bottles are clean before you start. If you want to flavor your kombucha, um, I think the best way to do that is with natural fruit. You know, uh, some some of the products you see out there use syrup or, you know, kind of some extra added sugar. Um, you know, what I like to teach is that fruit is definitely sweet enough. And um, something that I really like about what you guys do is um, I'm also a big gardener, so I enjoy, you know, my own herbs and uh, blending them in with different fruits to really get a deeper flavor for kombucha. So really, I think the key to, um, yes, you can definitely flavor kombucha at home. That's what the Booch Witch is all about. And, and like Holly said, follow me on social media. I'm always trying out uh, new combinations. Um, but I think really the key to the best flavoring at home is is to um, experiment with the fruits that you like and that you have on hand, you know, all the time at your house, you know, because it's it'll make it easy and, you know, it'll make it a lot more affordable too. But if you see some good sales when you're out, uh, that's always fun too. Like now is apple season, so that's what I'm experimenting with. Well, there's a lot of information that we're not going to get able to get through uh, talking with you, but I do want to touch on uh, when we have a SCOBY and we have it, I guess, uh, mature is not the right term, when it is established, how do we, because this thing keeps growing, how do you know when the right time to divide or split the SCOBY and start another batch with that division? So that is another really good question, and I would like to direct you and, you know, anyone who's interested in lis- listening and interested um, to visit my website, my blog. I have a blog called, Is It Time to Switch Your SCOBY? You can see online there are some pictures there. You know, you'll kind of see some layers start to form under your SCOBY. Um, it'll get, you know, if it's kind of, if it's any bigger than an inch thick, you'll probably notice those layers and, you um, I have a YouTube video on this blog, too, that talks a little bit about it, and I actually go through the whole process in under three minutes. Well, that's definitely very helpful because sometimes you look for videos on stuff and it's like 10 minutes. 19 minutes long, and it's the last 30 seconds to actually talk (laughs) about what, yeah, it's terrible. Okay. Right, Um, it is. And, you know, pro tip, you can definitely speed me up two times the speed. I sound a lot funnier, but you can definitely get the gist of it that way, too. (laughs) <laughs> That's great. Um, so how can people find out more about you? I know you mentioned your website, and I think uh, for lo- for more local people, you have a class coming up soon? I do, yeah. Um, if, you, if, if people are interested in finding me, you can find me online, boochwitch.com. And I do have a class in southern Wisconsin, in Janesville, Wisconsin, in the Rotary Botanical Gardens on Halloween. And there's information on that on my website as well. 
Absolutely. Well, Katie, we greatly appreciate the time and the abundance of information that you've provided, not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners uh, in this short period of time we've been given. I really enjoyed it. Thank you both so much, Holly and Joey. I really enjoyed uh, being here and hope you both have a have a good day. You too. Thank you. And do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company designs greenhouses specifically built for the northern Midwest climate. All of their greenhouses are made to withstand heavy snow and wind for years to come. They build freestanding and home-attached greenhouses for both commercial growers, schools, and backyard gardeners. Visit WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. For more information on pricing or to request a greenhouse catalog, go to WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. At Big Elk Garlic Farm, they are passionate about their garlic and take great care to provide you with the best seed stock around. Their high-quality garlic is non-GMO. They stand behind their product 100%. Get your garlic for this fall's planting at Big Elk Garlic Farm. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for being a part of the program. We appreciate you each and every week tuning in. And we know some of you have listened to every episode of every show that we've done. And some of you have joined us for the first time this year. And this may be your first episode. And we appreciate that. You can find all past shows at our website. That website is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. Don't let the name fool you. We've got content for all types of of gardeners and gardening situations there. You can get a hold of us if you've got a question. You can jam your fingers in the phone right now and give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Or if it's more convenient for you, you can certainly give us an email. If you have the Internet, you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will get your question addressed and answered and get you on the way to be a better gardener. We had a number of questions come in this week. Holly, you had one in regarding to garlic. Yeah, our uh, garden friend, Michelle, she wanted to know, um, she said that she lives in Zone 5A, and she wants to plant her garlic, and she knows that we t- we typically, and she typically plants it the first weekend in October here. Um, but she's doing some traveling and helping out some family, and she won't be back until after October 20th, and she wanted to know if she should plant it now before she leaves or after she comes back. It would be best to plant it after 
you come back. Get your garlic from BigElkGarlicFarm.com and have it ready to go, but don't plant it until you get back. Here's the reasons why it is important to, in this situation, uh, based on your growing zone, this differ- difference uh, based on where you're at, but you want to, if you had the choice of planting an earlier or later, later is the best option because we do not want the garlic to get too, too top growth, too much top growth on it. Yes, you're going to have, and we have when we plant it the first Saturday in October here in the southeast Wisconsin area, we have three, maybe four inches of top growth by the time the front ground freezes and the plant goes into dormancy. If you plant it too early, the soil is very warm. The plant's going to have eight, nine, possibly more inches of top growth, which is not good for when that plant goes into a dormancy state. So you want that roots to get established, which typically will occur before you begin to see top growth. Uh, but you can have a little top growth. It's okay. Plant it a little later. The goal realistically is to get this in the ground about two to four inches based on your density of soil four inches if you're in a raised bed two to three if you're in the regular ground about 30 days before your first hard freeze so the plant can get roots set and then it will go into a dormant stage and then you're good to go and then you'll harvest it the following june or july based on the variety so later rather than earlier in this situation Right. So, um, so the, this other question came in. Um, there are small black dots on my cabbage plants, possibly eggs of some time, some kind. How should I get rid of that? Yes, them uh, are eggs of the most likely the cabbage worm. Uh, hand pick the eggs off the plant. You can blast it with uh, water uh, or BT, which is a natural occurring bacteria. You can use natural oils to spray on that. Also, by taking just tape, uh, very heat, very sticky tape, and wrap it backwards, uh, invert it on your hand, and then you can tap the plant that way, and it will uh, release the eggs into that tape, and then you can dispose of the tape into the trash. Or if you have some really sick, demented type of fun, you put it in the fire and burn it uh, if you, if you uh, want to get the eggs killed that way, which right. is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. I was wondering why my early girl tomatoes, which look great up until now, are starting to have splits and wrinkles in their skin along the top perimeter. Was it because the cooler temperatures and the wet weather we experienced in the past week here in southeast Wisconsin, we had uh, very, very cool and very wet conditions uh, if you're in other parts of the country that you wish you had that. That's what this question is referring to. Um uh, if I cut the, the area off, will I still be able to use them for canning? Sure. So what happens is that we were where we are and, and this can, this can take place anywhere. Right. But we had a lot of rain last week and, um, what had happened was, is that you get that splitting at the top of the tomato and it's because of, of something like that heavy rain or inconsistent watering where the tomato will grow, it'll be growing and then it gets a large rush of water it grows a little bit faster than it should, and you get that cracking and splitting. Some heirloom varieties are going to do this no matter what. It's just part of their, their part makeup, of their, yeah. yeah. Um, but it is common when it when it comes to inconsistent watering. When we have five days of rain, is there anything you can do about it? No. But if you if you don't, you can you know get an irrigation system, whatever. Um, as far as canning them, that's fine. You just remove the skins. You don't even have to cut that bad part off. You just want to make sure you just remove the skins, and then you can can them. And, and you do have to remove the skins when it comes to to canning. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's with pretty much any. Well, isn't that basically with ninety five percent of the items that one would can the skin removes because of? Yeah, pretty much. Well, th- this is not the same for tomatoes. Okay. But, for tomatoes, they, the skin gets rubbery. Right, that's yeah. what I'm referring to. But yeah. the, most of the recipes in, uh, require you to remove the, the skin of the item in which right. you're canning right? because of a variety of different reasons. Right, yeah. Okay, so this is my first year trying to plant Brussels sprouts. This question is from Rosemary. I am wondering what is going on. I didn't stake them. I should have. I watched your video on YouTube and cut the tops off mid-August. Now the tops look like cabbage and little ones near the bottom look like they're rotting. Any okay. insight and advice would be appreciated. Okay, so you don't have to stake your your uh, Brussels sprout plants. And, Rosemary, we appreciate you watching our videos uh, on the YouTube. Just search the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and there's like 1,700, 1,800 videos of us in the garden and in the radio studio. Um, Brussels sprouts do not need to be staked. 
you do top them uh, approximately about 45 days prior to when you would project a harvest would come, simply because that's going to prevent or reduce or slow down vertical growth and focus more energy on sprout production. Uh, and you can start seeing the, node, the, the sprouts develop in the nodes of the leaf's uh, junction or the armpit of the, the leaf, however you want to describe that being. And uh, the tops, whenever you do remove the tops uh, and you top them, those sprouts that are closest to that cut are going to kind of open up or or blow apart a little bit because of the the just the way it is. Those are still edible, right. even, even though they're not you know nestled in a sprout or a tiny little it's cabbage. Still, yeah, yeah, it's still like it's it's still a, a whatever Brussels sprout. It's just not so compact. Now this is how we do the Brussels sprouts. A lot, some people will start chopping the lower leaves off. We cut the tops off. And you will occasionally get some of the smaller sprouts, uh, based on your condition to start rotting a little bit. Um, uh, other times it will, you will just, you, it will appear to be rotten, but it's just a dry layer or a few layers of the uh, sprout itself. Like a giant cabbage, you got to pull back some of the, the drier layers in order to get to the good part of the cabbage. Same thing with the, the Brussels sprouts. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Brussels sprouts, if you are going and you're cringing because we're talking about Brussels sprouts, you've clearly not had homegrown or farmer's market Brussels sprouts. The stuff in the store is, uh, you know. And you probably possibly had them. The stuff over, in the store is no good. Right. They're, yeah. It's not very good. Or you've had them overcooked where they're mushy and they're tasteless. Or, or they went from green when they went in the oven to almost black when they came out. <laughs> right. So, um, so homegrown Brussels sprouts cooked properly is a game changer versus some mushy, gross, tasteless Brussels sprouts. You that your Aunt have. Gina made because uh, that was her specialty and nobody had the heart to tell her, lady, you ain't, this ain't no specialty. Right. So I got another, another question came in. I'm wanting to grow herbs, the legal kind, in the kitchen window over winter, basil, sage, rosemary. What is some advice that you can offer I do have not the best window bay in the world. It does get drafty at times. What can you advise on how and where and when to put them by the window? Thanks. Well, one thing that you and I grow inside is rosemary. Right. And that's a pretty hardy plant. It, it does have it does have its moments because if you water it too much, you can get root rot. If you don't water it enough, they like a cold or like they, they like a completely dry and then a very moist cycle. They right. don't like to have damp roots. For any period of time. Well, that's one. Um, another one would be cilantro. We've grown cilantro indoors plenty of times. Okay. So explain people who love cilantro and can't get the sucker to grow outside because by the time they plant the seeds, turn around, is bolting. We planted in party cups. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, so like if I want cilantro and I know I'm going to want it every you, week. You can do this in a wide mouth pint jar too. Right. If I know I'm going to want it like every week or whatever, we plant it one week. And then plant more the next week. And we kind of do this through a cycle. And that way we're always having cilantro ready. And the reason why it works indoors is because uh, when it's outside, it's more susceptible to the heat or the day length or whatever. And that's why it tends to bolt. So when it's inside, it doesn't do that. Because it's, it's a controlled environment. Control now, environment. in regards to the draftiness of the window, you're, it, it's it's all per case situation if you've got a lot of draft, you may need to cover the inside with one of those plastic things, you know, even though you may lose a lot, a little bit of your ledge just to... Per oh, yeah, the, the window plastic. Window plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, if you keep your house at a, you know, 68, 72 degree ambient temperature, even with that little draft, it's probably not going to be detrimental to the basil, the rosemary, the sage, or the cilantro because the majority of the air is coming to it. Right. Um, so you can grow a number of herbs that way and you can just grow them on little pots and you don't have to do anything fancy. Um, it's pretty basic. It's just like growing little house plants. However, watering. What, you want to make sure you do water them properly. Because in the winter, the air is drier and they dry out much, much quicker than you think. Mm -hmm. And the, and the amount of soil as right. well. Right. And you're also, um, you're also planting, if you're planting in little, you know, uh, I don't know maybe like the size of a milk carton or whatever container, 
you do have to water a bit more frequently. Uh, always, you know, make it on a regiment because the le- least amount, l- the lower amount of soil, the smaller mass soil dries out quicker. Five gallon bucket dries out a lot slower than a, you know, a, a coffee cup. So keep that in mind. Well, we are out of time. Thank you for yours. Did you mention any portion of this show or you want to revisit it? You can certainly do that. A couple of different options. One being by going to the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and clicking on the season four tab at the top of the page. Or you can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we'll send you the link to this show. Tell your garden friends and your garden buddies that this program is on the air. That's how our message is shared. Join us next week on the program when we'll be talking about indoor non-edible plants and leaves. Get them ready for your garden and the benefits that they can provide for your soil. As well as we'll, we'll have guest Susanna Shamrack. Uh, with us, she is an author all about elderberries. You'll, we're going to learn a whole lot and your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>